we will actually split it in two um, in two parts. And for the first part, we'll um, talk to Vaitea from Inapta. Hello, Vaitea. Great to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. And also Ikuo, who is joining us from Tokyo. And let's see if we can see you already. Hello, Iku. Great to have you here. Um, and Iku will tell us in a moment what he does, um, because it's a fascinating story. Um, and then later on, we also have Wilang and also Knut join us. Um, so, um, yeah, let's kick it, kick it off, I would say. And Vaitea, let's start with you, since you are, you're right here next to my side. Um, and tell us maybe, so um, you're growing your own startup in NAFTA right now. Um, out, um, or you're also like operating from Berlin. So, um, can you tell us just very briefly what does Inapta do, um, and also in the context of let's say innovation for more sustainable cities? Absolutely. So, Inapta is an electrolyzer manufacturer. An electrolyzer is a device that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen, and our mission is to replace fossil fuels. So the only way to do this is to make green hydrogen cost effective. And this is where we're at in our journey, mass producing electrolyzers. How did we even come across electrolysis technology was uh, at the Peace Warehouse, which is a self-sufficient home in Thailand, in Chiang Mai. And this house relies only on sun and hydrogen. That's it nothing else, and I was completely um, amazed by it uh, right after finishing my studies, moved to Chiang Mai, saw this home, thought, who are these people coming up with these ideas? I must meet them, and this is how I met Sebastian and Jan, who are now today the co-founders of Anapter. And they had bought their electrolyzer system in their home from this company in Italy, and they are the manufacturer of the electrolyzer. So they've been developing this for over 10 years. And they were missing a bit of focus in um, their business growth. And so with Sebastian and Jan, we decided to help them. And uh, Sebastian acquired their debt. Hanaptor was co-founded and created in uh, November 2017. And this is how it all began, where we narrowed down the focus on the anion exchange membrane uh, electrolyzer and understanding, okay, how can we make more of them? How can we make them less expensive? How can we make them smaller? And since we've started now, we've come out with two different versions of the electrolyzer, making it already smaller, uh, less expensive, more efficient, and now the focus is um, extending the lifetime, increasing the efficiency, and also understanding that energy companies of the future are not just hardware-based. They're also software based. And so we've developed our energy management system. Our team here is in St. Petersburg, which is kind of extending our international reach. And here the, um, the idea of the EMS is to make it easy to integrate uh, hydrogen because hydrogen is only one piece of the puzzle. It cooperates with a whole ecosystem, right? Solar panels, inverters, batteries, fuel cells, all these components need to understand how are they performing. You need to set up rules, have predictive maintenance possibilities. And this is where we all come together as a team from a hardware perspective, software perspective, and uh, now scaling up as well our operations uh, soon in Germany. Super interesting. So what? Um, so you actually went to Italy first. So you had the idea in Thailand. You went to Italy then. Um, to talk to the people that, that have been doing this. Now you are building a new, let's say, the next level of, of the, the, the tech as well. But um, what's your relation then also to Berlin? So Because you are based, based here in Berlin. As I far am. As it. Yeah, so, so. Uh, Sebastian and Jan are from Hamburg. And when we were deciding where should an after grow, we were already well aware of uh, Germany's involvement in hydrogen. There's a very clear strategy. Just recently, they also announced the, their uh, whole hydrogen roadmap with a clear budget. And since the very beginning, Germany has been very... Um, clear that green hydrogen would be a future energy transition uh, goal. And we thought, okay, we have to come to uh, Europe. We will, of course, keep our production in Italy, but we also want to have our Hauptstadt Bureau in uh, Berlin, knowing as well already that um, we will scale up and the scale up would take place in Germany. 
Makes sense. And uh, tell us maybe uh, just a little bit, give us a better sense, be, um, specifically like use cases maybe on a neighborhood scale, on a city scale, on district scale that we can, you know, might in five or ten years time, let's say, enough to um, rolls out their, their tech uh, in the capital. Like what, what would be our new reality? What would it feel like? What, what would be the upsides, the benefits of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'd like to start answering this question just more from a sense perspective and then going more into the technical side. Um, but if a world was powered by hydrogen, there it would be very quiet and there would be no smell of uh, gas exhaustion pipes. Um, so it would be a, a different reality where things are uh, seemingly more calm. We can still get around. Nothing is holding us back, but it's much more quiet um, and uh, there's no CO2 emission. So just from a sensorial perspective, it changes. Um, If we start at an individual perspective, how would my life change if I were running on hydrogen? Um, we have some use cases, for example, in Germany or in Italy or also in the UK, where homeowners are generating their own power on site. They have solar panels installed with inverters, and then our electrolyzer is plugged in. When the batteries are full, then the hydrogen production starts so that in the evening or also in the winter, hydrogen can be used uh, for long-term energy supply. It's a fantastic case for seasonal storage, for example, in remote locations when you can, can go to France and the Alps and you have this chalet running on hydrogen. But when we are in the city, at an individual perspective, it's really taking ownership of your energy production and being fully uh, independent on that side. Um, And you are also doing a project with Greenpeace, right? You yeah. mentioned. Yeah, so we were um, a part of their Smart Grow Accelerator program, and it's a quite a, an interesting one as we are developing the business case for uh, not only uh, power for a neighborhood, but also heating a neighborhood. Because uh, hydrogen is a gas, and we already have a natural gas grid infrastructure built out, and we can inject the hydrogen into the natural gas grid, um, which is a way to decarbonize heat, which is very difficult to electrify. So this is still in the development stage, but um, in the Netherlands, with the DNVGL, the community of Rotterdam, and the gas network operator Steden, we already have a power to heat uh, application running where um, we have a, a bis um, an apartment complex that is uh, running with um, its hydrogen container in the back to power, uh, yeah, to provide heat in the winter. Cool. This sounds, it indeed sounds like the future, uh, like a much nicer future, if I can imagine, you know. Um, being just completely free from fossil fuels and also just with the noise, with the smell, everything you mentioned, I think uh, we can get a good sense of it. Um, I would maybe now uh, switch to you, Iku, to also like give you the chance to, again, introduce yourself a little bit. Um, you have a very special relationship to Asia Berlin Summit as well because you're also one of the ambassadors um, uh, to it. So, um, But also we briefly in the panel before we already spoke of one very special uh, company that's uh, just recently also last week made the headlines again uh, of raising their Series C funding, um, which is Infarm. And Infarm, maybe tell us what Infarm does, what's your involvement with Infarm? Um, coming to Japan. Right now, I am uh, running the in farm for uh, Japan as a regional entity, a uh, subsidiary of the uh, in farm DMDH, a headquarters in Japan. And uh, what in farm does is a, a growing a vegetable uh, inside of the supermarket restaurants, just in front of your customers and consumers. Uh, That's the, the reasons. Uh, the reason is, uh, uh, I think uh, some of you guys have uh, uh, noticed 80% of the vegetables are going to be wasted uh, before uh, the vegetables come to the table. And uh, during those uh, process, uh, lots of energy are going to be uh, consumed under lots of CO2, uh, CO2 I mean emission uh, generated. So that is not probably uh, you know, a good idea for uh, this farm. So that's why we decided we bring our farms into the cities where uh, people live, uh, consume, or uh, uh, that's why uh, we bring our uh, farms in front of the customers and consumers at the uh, supermarkets and restaurants. So uh, that's the idea. And, uh, <coughs> 
the background uh, how I found on myself uh, getting disease for each other was uh, back in November 2015. Uh, at the time, I was running the other company called the uh, Sandwich Global Ventures, uh, which is a, a seed early stage focused investor and the uh, seed accelerator kind of organization. And uh, we were running the uh, self event uh, for the uh, Innovation Weekend, and uh, we visited uh, Silicon Valley, New York City, Boston, London, and also uh, Norway uh, as one of the destinations where uh, we uh, hosted our event. And Infarm was the uh, first winner uh, at the uh, Innovation Weekend Berlin. And uh, the idea was uh, all the winners and the runners up uh, from a single city uh, had been invited to Tokyo to compete for the uh, grand champion of the year. And so that's why we invited uh, Infarm to Tokyo. And then Infarm won the other uh, grand champion winner uh, in the 2015 season. So that's the other uh, story. We met each other. And uh, I'll make a long story short, but uh, so, uh, we were uh, thinking and uh, uh, planning to uh, expand into the uh, Japanese market. And then uh, eventually we established the uh, Infarm Japan, uh, a subsidiary of Infarm German headquarters, a uh, parent company. Uh, February this year, and uh, I have uh, become managing director in Farm Japan. So that's the story. If you uh, would like to ask me anything, uh, please. Great, thanks a lot, Iku. Um, so both of I actually have a question to both of you and uh, and Vitea as well. So both of you are active in Japan. Um, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome? to go to Japan, let's say, with a European product, if you want to say so. And maybe, Vite uh, um, or Iko, we can start with you and then we get to Vaitian. Uh, no, no, no. I would like to pass on uh, to the other. Uh, sorry, I don't remember her name. But Va Vitea. Uh, yeah, OK. Sure, Vitea. Go ahead. <laughs> OK, sure. So our systems are generating hydrogen at 35 bar. And Japan has a completely different regulation for this. And they need hydrogen at 8 bar. So it's not really about adapting the electrolyzer completely differently, but it's about acknowledging it by making some technical modifications from the pressure valves and the gauge. So we just have to remember, okay, when we're shipping to Japan, we are making a different system. So this was one of the um, yeah, key points that we really do need to keep in, in mind because it's the only, we know that when an eight bar system is coming out, it's always flying to Japan. So I would say this was uh, one of the challenges um, from a technical perspective. Language is always uh, <laughs> quite a, a tricky one as well uh, to, to be sure that we can communicate. Um, so we have a colleague that is German and speaks uh, fluent Japanese, which is extremely helpful. But when we um, attend trade shows, we also now uh, are joined by uh, students that are uh, into electrochemistry and want to know more about what we're doing and also get involved. And uh, they've been also helping out. And then translating our website to Japanese was also a, a key element to be sure that this door is open and that um, there is no communication barriers uh, because green hydrogen is, is really international. It's an international solution. What were some, I can also imagine, you know, you guys are busy, like every startup, a uh, startup uh, uh, with a million things, but then like what, what's, what, what's the point where you also as a founder, you actually feel comfortable to put in that investment to, you know, translate your whole website to Japan, to, uh, to Japanese, to like, you know, maybe get someone on staff, you know, who does speak Japanese. Like what's, what's, because it seems to always be like a, a tricky, you know, uh, what's the right balance when, when to go all in and. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, 
you really underestimate actually how much work it's going to take to translate your website into eight different languages. Um, and especially if you want to make it organically and not make your website sound like a robot, um, especially with like style in French or German and Japanese, it's just, it is a challenge. But what we've uh, realized and what we appreciate about the Japanese market, although there is a time challenge where um, whereas, for example, in Germany, you may not meet your customer ever, and they'll just place an order, and they're happy with it, and okay, maybe you meet them in a year. Um, in Japan, we've met some uh, now customers last year, and we developed the relationship for a whole year, where we're constantly present and we're in touch, but we know that this trust has been established, and they are loyal customers. It's the, the time investment that you make in the beginning, maybe for one year, but um, the business relationship that continues um, doesn't really have an end date. So it is worth the investment because you know that um, there is loyalty, there is trust, and um, it's you've, you've made it through the hard part, and now it's just about continuing to work together. How can you create this trust right now in this crazy year that we have where travel is like, you know, such a such a problem. It is a, it is a big challenge. Um, however, since we, we haven't um, made, well actually no, in Japan this year, um, there was still the fuel cell expo that was held during the Smart uh, Energy Week in Tokyo. So we were still able to meet some new partners, some new customers, and that was kind of like our last chance uh, to really enter into uh, to, to Japan and to be present. And I, I think the trick here is, is always being present, always being there, always having an open ear. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge because it's only one of our colleagues that speaks Japanese and he's also involved with many other uh, German-related topics in business development. So um, yeah, I would really just advise to, to, to just be patient and also understand that it is a different business culture, there is a different etiquette, and um, there are different milestones to hit before you make a sale. And it's not really about it's not a hard sell. It's much more about understanding your counterparts and understanding as well the business organization in Japan and the hierarchy that, that does exist as opposed to the flat hierarchy we have at Anapter. So um, taking these things into consideration does go a long way. Great. Thanks for those insights. Ikuo, tell us your story. What were some of the uh, challenges, I, some of the maybe difficult moments also that you found? Uh, actually, uh, so excuse me. So could I see the the, the your uh, place uh, on the uh, window as well? I just uh, see my face, you know, double. Uh, it's not a uh, comfortable for me, actually. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, let's. Oh, I see. I see. Um, I would like to see you, and I I would like to. Uh, yeah. Here. Sorry, I don't know how should I pronounce your name. Oh, you're quite close. Vitea. Vitea, okay. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Let's see if we can switch Thanks. the view. Yeah, exactly. Now we can switch the view that in the stream, I think people see you. We won't see you okay, now, so but... Still, I, okay, so I can see your, uh, your venue, uh, unfortunately. Okay, go ahead. So now you're small. Actually, uh, I really agree with uh, uh, Vitea. Uh, so all uh, everything she mentioned. So uh, language... Uh, barrier is a very, very big challenge uh, for the uh, foreign startups who are interested into the Japanese market. So except the uh, some uh, industries, uh, for example, uh, internet related, I mean, IT related industries or uh, finance, fintech, AI, except those kind of industries, uh, even though the, uh, the kind of executives or you know, higher level people uh, do not speak any uh, decent language. So that is a very uh, critical uh, the challenge for foreign startups. And also, as she mentioned, uh, the culture is very, very different from the, uh, uh, the ones in uh, European countries. So uh, the challenge is uh, Infarm uh, uh, has been facing with is uh, almost of them already uh, told by uh, uh, Viteria, uh, sorry, Viteria. So uh, I don't know what should I uh, add on her uh, topic, but... Uh, um, maybe, Iku, I don't know if you, you know, it's, it's, you know, maybe you have a funny anecdote to share or something like this. If not, I have right away another um, question to both of you, actually, also in terms of like when you feel when is the right time, you know, for a company from Europe to say, look and go east? 
it's a very difficult question. Uh, I, I don't think uh, we can tell uh, the answer in general. Uh, the right timing is, uh, uh, it all depends on the, uh, uh, the every single startup. So it depends. But on the experience of, of let's say, Infirm, like you mentioned that they okay. went to, uh, through, the, through the award, they came to Tokyo okay. and uh, it seems like also the product had a certain maturity. It, you know, did, you know, how to, also how you then went, like jumped on board to really like set it up for them. Um, you know, what were some of the, the conditions at the time, right, that made all of this possible? Okay, understood. So, uh, in general, uh, most of the people or companies or even the, uh, the startups or, or big corporations, uh, in terms of the foreign uh, startups or, you know, uh, innovation happening outside of Japan, uh, of course, it depends on the, uh, the industries where people are, are, are living, but the Silicon Valley is still uh, almost the almost the only destination or the agenda uh, they are interested in. So to get the attention and to appeal to the Japanese audience are, uh, is very difficult from the uh, European startups. That is the the truth in general. So that's the uh, the first one, and the second one is. Uh, to come into the Japanese market, as she mentioned, it requires uh, them or us a uh, very long time uh, to establish the uh, kind of trust uh, as a, a relationship. So that's why it uh, also means the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the financial condition should be uh, kind of robust. Uh, so that's why uh, Infarm uh, was very much interested in uh, coming to the Japanese market uh, uh, when Infarm was still seed in the early stage. But uh, uh, we needed to wait until we established the other decent business and uh, kind of uh, anyway develop the business in the uh, home ground, I mean, European market. So we need uh, uh, enough cash uh, to uh, be able to wait for a long time and uh, uh, the possible uh, endurance. So the finance situation would be the second uh, condition uh, to evaluate uh, if this is the right time. And the third, uh, third one is, uh, of course, we need to understand the uh, Japanese market. So we need to conduct the other uh, uh, feasibility study or et cetera, anyway, prelim uh, preliminary uh, assessment. So uh, to make those study, as uh, this is also mentioned by Vaitir, uh, 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 so someone uh, you need someone who speaks the other uh, Japanese, I mean, a bilingual uh, stuff. So those three conditions are the uh, things you need to think uh, when you decide to come into the Japanese market. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, still in general, but uh, uh, based on my uh, experiences, I think so. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks, Iku. Vaitia, do you have, what's your take on this? Yeah, no, I think this was very wise advice. Um, as a startup, you do get quite excited about new markets, and you're just like, let's go, especially if it's Tokyo, there is this excitement. But I think um, having yourself established somewhere before just fanning yourself out is always the, the, the better decision. Um, but I think at the same time, um, we saw specifically for our industry that both Japan and Germany were very active in uh, hydrogen. There is a strategy that's been set out. Japan has coined itself as a hydrogen society. Um, had there been the Olympics this year, it would have been a whole showcase for hydrogen. So um, we already had this confidence that hydrogen, there was a, a, a national commitment to hydrogen. So we, we knew that there was a interest in uh, in green hydrogen. So we felt um, confident to go there and to, to 
to, to be present because when we think about the energy transition, it really has to happen at a global scale. It's a question of international cooperation. It's just, we will be as strong as, a, as the weakest link. And I think Japan is a fantastic partner to move forward in terms of bringing, um, in terms of scaling up green hydrogen adoption. And you mentioned, mentioned also already that your product, you know, needs to build a lot of trust. That's not a hard sell. But so would there, would have, is it an option for you to scale in the sense like through a reseller at all? Or would it always be like, you know, you are in control of the process of the uh, relationships you are developing, let's say, in-house? In Yeah, I think um, working with a trading partner gives you a lot of uh, advantages because they have already established a relationship as well with the end user, whether it's a, most often it's a company, it's more B2B sales. Um, so I, I think it really works in pairs to establish a relationship with a trading company or another type of partner and um, also to still be you know, independent, still have your own contacts, have your own um, flexibility as well to operate in the Japanese market so you can really come at it from both sides. Mm. Uh, were, were there any, maybe to, to finish up also, were there any surprises when in general it doesn't need to be related to, the, to Japan now, but like in general, like coming from Europe, going to Asia, anything unexpected that happened? Um, yeah, I can, I can share too. Um, I mean, one of the surprises uh, uh, was, I mean, yeah, it's, it's more like uh, something that we learned and mm -hmm. then more of like a funny anecdote. Uh, so something that we learned is, uh, yeah, when we came out with the latest models, we uh, sent out our latest data specs and then we realized, oh no, we used the standard model, which is the European one, and it didn't say eight bar, it said 35 bar. Here goes all of our credibility and it was a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. We were like, oh no, we just sent them the, we, we didn't adapt it even though it was the same system. So lesson learned, um, really, remember that you are dealing with a completely different market and adapt <laughs> adapt your specs. And then um, in terms of how we've surprised them, um, I think uh, they're, they're always quite surprised that um, Sebastian is our chairman and he is the eldest and he's yeah, kind of the one in charge. So from a hier hierarchical perspective, he would be the top guy. Um, but it's most often actually his son, Jan and I, that are partaking in the uh, relationship building in terms of trying out the whiskey distilleries and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, spending uh, some time developing their relationships. That doesn't sound too bad, bad to me as a side effect. Iko. Is there any, anything surprising, anything funny, maybe an anecdote you have when it comes to the, let's say, uh, European uh, Asian bridge building? Actually, uh, I'm a Japanese and I'm based in Tokyo. So uh, to me, uh, there are you know, no funny things, unfortunately, or fortunately. So, but the one thing I learned uh, from the other uh, in-farm business so far is the uh, concept and the recognition uh, towards the uh, LED and hydroponics are, are based uh, vegetables are, are very different from the other uh, ones in Europe and the uh, ones in Japan. So simply speaking, of course, it depends on people and the other uh, the regions, but the, some of the people still have a negative perception through the uh, uh, LED hydroponics surface, the uh, produced uh, vegetables, because those people love uh, naturally growing harvested vegetables to such a uh, kind of, how should I say, technology driven uh, vegetables. That is a uh, very big uh, hurdle we need to uh, tackle and we need to uh, get over. So, but the, uh, because of the lots of uh, typhoons and uh, climate change and uh, global warming and the lots of uh, natural disasters happening in Japan, it's uh, themselves are very, uh, you know, unfortunately for Japanese uh, people, of course, but the, those things kind of, uh, you know, getting people understand and uh, change their mind, uh, the how, we can uh, keep the uh, kind of sustainable agriculture versus natural uh, traditional uh, agriculture. And the other issue is the average age of the, uh, uh, the farmers in Japan is 67 years old, very old. And the average age of uh, those people 
uh, to be retired is 75 years old, meaning we have another seven or eight years. So that's why our, uh, as long as we can develop the uh, kind of alternative or the solutions or the, uh, uh, the methodologies, so we cannot keep the other uh, uh, vegetables and the fruits uh, for uh, Japanese people uh, if we don't import anything. But the, to import those things, as I mentioned at the beginning, so uh, that uh, requires to spend the lots of you know energies and gasolines and uh, generate the CO2, etc. So then people are getting to realize. Uh, LED and hydroponics are uh, produced the uh, vegetables. Uh, one of the very good uh, alternative uh, the ways and the solution. So that is uh, what I learned mm. from the other uh, uh, journey of Infarm so far. I think you're making a very good point that at the end of the day, yes, we talk about expanding to a foreign markets, but it's very much also expanding to different cultures. And I think that also means demographics, like other societal debates, discussions that we always need to keep in mind when we when we do that. Um, thank you so much, Vaitea and Iku, for joining us uh, for this. Um, uh, excuse me, could I, could I add one more thing? Yes, of course, please. Go ahead. Uh, during the other, uh, uh, how should I say, when we were uh, thinking and uh, you know planning to, and also uh, getting the uh, clients, uh, actually uh, we, I mean, uh, in the infarm, we had uh, lots of uh, fights. You know, the people in headquarter at the beginning, of course, you know, uh, including the founders, uh, they understood the, the Japanese market and the differences, but the someone didn't at, at the beginning. So uh, we sometimes had a, a very serious fight, actually. But the, uh, the end of the day, so uh, they understood, and I also understood why they didn't, you know, appreciate the, the what I told about the Japanese market, etc. So uh, we needed time, even internally. So that is the the other. Mm -hmm lesson uh, learned from uh, the uh, infant business. That's a very, very important uh, point as well. Thank you so much, Iko. Thanks especially, uh, you know, joining us all the way from uh, Tokyo. Um, and let's give it a round of applause, I would say. Perfect. And so next up, I will thank you right here. Um, I'll invite Knud and Wilang. Please come up on stage with me for our next two entrepreneur stories. All right, lovely to have you here as well. Um, we'll do the same format and maybe I'll start with you, Wilang. Um, uh, tell us a little bit also like, you know, um, what you do or maybe first, let me start a little bit with your background because you have, um, you are, let's say, a go-to-market specialist. So that is a very useful skill when we talk about scaling. And especially, you're from Singapore, as I gather, you um, worked a lot with big brands like Apple and Siemens in Southeast Asia, helping them to do, go to different markets. Um, and it's I myself lived in Singapore for uh, studied there, backpacked a lot back in the day, and I was amazed by the diversity of the place, of the whole region, as well. Um, so how can you like, you know, what what does it mean? What makes a good go-to-market strategy? Um, maybe just from you as a go-to-market uh, strategy expert to begin with. Yeah, sure. Ple Hi, pleasure to be here. Um, it's really great to come back here. I've been attending as um, an attendee for the last few years and great to speak now. Um, to your question on strategy, I think coming from the region and having helped companies from overseas try and expand into um, different markets within a region, I think what's really important is that we are looking at a strategy for a specific market. And you know, a company's strategy for specific markets can be really sometimes quite different from the overall company strategy. And it all boils down to um, the objective of what you're trying to achieve in the market because it can be really different depending on the competitors that are already in there, the culture that's uh, present in that market, and 
really most importantly, the kind of resources that you have and are willing to spare at that moment in time. So just give you an example. Um, my experience back in Apple, right? Apple, as we know, when they started out as a company and they were trying to get their products out to the consumers, retail was a very big part when they um, expanded in the US. But when they went into Southeast Asia, for the longest time, it was only up till five years ago that they first had their first Apple retail store in Singapore, first in the region. But before that, for 10, whole, more than 10 years before, they had a, they had a education team just focusing on trying to build relationships with the schools, trying to get adoption. And adoption was their objective of what they want to achieve in the market. They wanted people to get in touch with the products. So on the retail front, they worked through partners, channel partners, they had distributors, but they left it aside. And when they did go into retail and build that retail store, it was really about building a community around it. So they built, um, and it was still focused on adoption. They have now, um, entrepreneurs, they have artists coming in, sharing about how they utilize the product, and that was why they had that retail store to engage with the community. So in that sense, you know, a, a good strategy needs to be relevant to the market, it needs to be relevant to the kind of resources that you have at the point in time, and also, uh, yeah, what, what um, that the, the maturity of the market demands at the point in time. Um, I think that uh, sounds very reasonable and it's a super interesting story from, from Apple, how they went about it. Um, so you came to Berlin like about three years ago and you actually now founded your own startup, your own, uh, 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 let's say like I idea baby you want to <laughs> develop from, from, um, uh, from here on, on topics like sustainability as well. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, idea baby is quite a nice, sweet term for it. I, yes, it is still infant stages, um, but I came to Berlin three years ago because you know it's whole, the startup scene here is really vibrant. Um, it gives a different international perspective to you know the market expertise that I've had for Southeast Asia just by living here, working with people here. And my passion has always been in environmental sustainability. Um, and very much the idea of like circularity in the economy, but more so um, the social aspects of how people are very much, it's very much a social issue when it comes to, um, uh, let's say waste problems, waste management problems with um, single use disposals, packaging, excessive packaging and products. And uh, when I started getting into upcycling, I came up, I looked around me and it's like, hey, there's so many things that we use on a daily basis that just serve one single purpose and it could be sometimes not necessary. So how do we make use of these uh, materials and items and bring it back so that they can live again as a different, uh, as a different uh, product or in a, a different life, repurposing them, reusing them. So, um, the idea for what, what I'm doing right now is really creating a platform where people can crowdsource for materials that they require. So you stop having to buy new things every time you want to create something. People, when there is um, demand for items that you would usually throw away on a regular basis, you, throw, you stop throwing them away because you start pegging a value that, hey, this can contribute to someone else's project. So yeah, that's the whole idea is to inject circularity back in the community and not just leaving it back into the infrastructure and systems where very much nowadays we focus on recycling, but recycling as a process itself takes up resources, energy, and you know, it could at the end of the day still be recycled, but maybe that same thing could have lived another four or five lives in someone else's uh, home. Yeah. So what's the, what's the name of it? Uh, it's called gallery, so the idea is that you recreate, you reinvent, you repurpose, you reuse things over and over again. What's your general feeling also of, let's say, the appetite of Southeast Asia as a region? Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about urban tech, we talk a lot about, like, you know, fossil-free, maybe even climate, not just climate neutral, maybe even climate positive, like, mm -hmm. cities, that's right, the ambition where we want to get. We know that kind of like Singapore is the poster child uh, that everyone uh, talks about. We had Ayesha give a keynote earlier today from there, which, um, you know, provides some incredible insights. But as a region for Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, what do you feel is the appetite for? Even those things like that you're working on now with your yeah. own company in terms of circular sure. economy. 
Sure. So as a Singaporean, I'm very proud that the country is doing a lot towards going smart nation, but also having like a huge, um, a, a big ambition for, for climate change because we have set aside like 100 billion just to tackle the climate change issues by 2050, right? That's a huge amount. Um, but for other, and for other parts of Southeast Asia, a lot, they're, they're faced with a lot of climate change challenges as well, especially geographically, you know, floods and, um, yeah, just heat, temperatures, sea level rising, parts of the cities, parts of the countries going underwater regularly, the big cities like Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh, uh, Jakarta, they've been getting increasingly under uh, water issues, floods, but also the water systems, right? So I'd say there is a huge appetite for urban tech, but Unlike Singapore, where the whole country is urbanized and it's an urban city in itself, they also have many other, uh, they have large rural areas that they have to look into. So yes, Bangkok, Jakarta, they are very densely populated cities with you know millions of people living in there. Um, and it's important for the country, but the outside, so the outside, outside of these um, big cities, there are also these rural areas where they're looking into agriculture, farming, fishing. So a lot of money has actually been going also into, um, so for example, Indonesia. A lot of money have been going to startups who are doing like smart fishing, um, uh, urban farming, but not just because they want to, they need to keep it within a small city space, but because um, of the, of the, uh, natural environment that has been that has kind of been eroded over time that you know fields are getting worse they need to get more efficient with the kind of minerals that they have available within their country so I'd say yes there is a huge appetite but not just what we know of as you know a smart urbanized uh, solution yeah um, you just mentioned uh, smart, uh, or, or you just mentioned like, uh, you know, like environment. Uh, uh, this is exactly the topic now, Knut, let's come um, and hear a little bit more also about um, what you are working on, because what I find interesting is um, in your role with Green Steps and the ARC that I hope you can tell us now uh, a little bit more about, your idea actually um, came from China. It you live for many years, you're actually, you're originally Austrian, you live for many, many years in, in Shanghai, and you started your business from Shanghai, now actually on a mission, let's say, to bring it back to Europe, which is also fascinating to hear from this. But um, let's start first, like, tell us about Green Steps, what's the idea behind it, um, in terms of natural nature education, um, and also of ARC. Yeah, um, so thank you for having also me here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm recently back. I'm only since two weeks back after 20 years living in China. Um, and we, we are scheduled to set up our operations here. Um, what is Green Steps? Green Steps is a startup at the intersection of ecology, education, and IT. Why so interdisciplinary? Um, because we think there's obviously a climate crisis there is a tremendous crisis in education, in case you haven't noticed. And we believe that uh, there is uh, tech available to really do social and environmental good. And um, we're basically siphoning off all the good mechanisms of Facebook, uh, Airbnb, and whatever it is. And we try to put this into a new platform that aggregates environmental education. And um, I can make a, a personal note. So you mentioned I'm Austrian, it's true. Um, Austria was, uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, the first country to introduce compulsory education for the entire population. I think it was only four years that happened somewhere in the 1780s. Um, for the entire population, I don't say for a bourgeois elite, for the entire population. And uh, we've been discussing this actually this weekend. Um, we really need to ask ourselves nowadays, what kind of education do we need to um, deal with all the problems that we face? And we believe it is environmental education in a very wide spectrum, um, how to deal with agriculture. What uh, Ikor mentioned uh, really 
gives me the chills because farmers are basically dying out in Japan. I don't think we can solve this only with technology. We need to get people, young people, interested to actually pick up this job. Um, and this is basically what we do. We started in China because we saw with our own kids and um, um, in a circle of families. I'm um, a multiple social entrepreneur. I founded a kindergarten. The parents initiated kindergarten in Shanghai 11 years ago. Um, and we saw that there is little access to nature um, and we wanted to just increase this. And uh, then I was digging into the entire mental health issue, nature deficit disorder, autism, and so on and so forth. And I actually observed a couple of really serious cases. Um, and we drove this even further and we, we, we realized uh, suicide rates, especially also child suicide rates, something that I was not aware of that it actually exists, are highest in Far East Asian countries. Um, in China, there's a big censorship about this topic, but a lot of children are very, very unhappy because there's such pressure in the education system, and it's all indoors. It's all cram schools on the weekends. Um, I, I can tell you I've witnessed myself a child burnout incident of an eight-year-old. It's, uh, it's a tremendous experience. And since I'm a father of two myself, I really felt, you know, I, I leave um, uh, corporate, the corporate world and bring my knowledge into this um, kind of endeavor. And I found a great partner, um, John, uh, a really brilliant outdoor educator and a Chinese partner who is helping us with all the uh, cultural issues also in, in Asia. Um, and so we, we moved forward. Uh, develop the training to make it really easy for adults and young people to guide children into nature. And then we realized that uh, this is not enough. If we really want to scale, we need to uh, address the fragmentation of environmental education. And um, if you go into this subject, you realize there's a lot of great content out there. There are Boy Scouts uh, active since 100 years. Um, there are nature friends active since 150 years. There are many new uh, or recent organizations like Sierra Club in, in the States um, that do a great job, but it is all fragmented across organizations and across nations. And, and our approach with this platform is to unify it because in the end, it's about the impact. It is not who is doing it, it is really about how do we create a better future. And the ARC is... Uh, is this integrated platform which we actually see as a social network because every user has its own profile and you can think of it like a Facebook profile or a LinkedIn profile where you only have two KPIs. One KPI is total hours spent on environmental education, no matter in which organization or where. And the second KPI is what we call a bioregional identity. So bioregional identity is a new kind of organizational concept it's not coming from us. There are tremendous scientists working about this. It's about biodiversity conservation. They broke down the planet in about 900 territories, averaging the size of Switzerland with an almost identical stock of plants and animals. And we think that this is what should be now a compulsory curriculum to connect to your environment. You need to know what is out there and not just know what is in the supermarket the story. Wow, oh, this was <laughs> incredible. Um, really fascinating um, also to hear about, you know, your personal motivation because I think when we talk about entrepreneurship, um, you know, at least to me, this is always the most exciting part of it, you know, where does this motivation to affect change, where does it come from? Um, I, uh, Knut, just because we also know each other from uh, a broader context, uh, uh, actually a, a program uh, called City Makers, um, uh, which was also funded by, by a German uh, foundation, Bosch Foundation, for the last couple of years, trying to bring those kind of change makers from China and, and, and Germany or Europe uh, together. Um, what has been now with your team, since you are very international and you have part of your design people and so on, also from based in Italy, for instance, like how does it work also on day by day, like running this, like, you know, still with a fairly small team, but like running and trying to capture two, two huge markets like this and also just doing the, the day by day, you know, the, with the, all the time difference and so on. 
So, I mean, the, the upside is definitely we are really international. So we, we, we have uh, in our software development team two people from Ghana, one from Mauritania, uh, two French, uh, Italian, uh, uh, Spanish, uh, Belgium, Chinese, obviously, from all over China. So it's, it's for me, this was always my dream to really work in a very international environment and have this cultural diversity, having also different input like on hand to have a, a faster iteration when you work on projects. This is great. The downside um, is, uh, of course, that during Corona, we really suffered a lot to keep uh, people just moving in a startup. I believe um, remote work doesn't, doesn't really function well. Um, you need to be very close, um, working with each other and driving things. Um, and in terms of uh, setting up now um, the European operations, um, for us, it was necessary to come to Europe because we saw that in terms of um, social development, the Chinese society, I think, is not ready really to pick up uh, our idea, at least the government part. We have a lot of support from civil society, but the government is not ready. And um, we uh, deal with um, daily operations to have very clear weekly scheduled meetings that are usually around two o'clock um, China time. And that works well. Why? Um, we apply uh, Frederic Laloux's reinventing organization principles. I don't know if you've heard of them. So we have a lot of self-management. Um, we believe in wholeness, no fixed work hours. So we have people who are climbing instructors and they just wanna work at night until 5 a.m. and the rest of the day because they're young and very agile. <laughs> um, they want to be in the mountains. Um, and this so far works quite well. I have to say I'm a bit traditional because I come from a top-down corporate world. It really challenges me quite often, but it helps uh, bridging also Asia and uh, Europe in terms of time difference. Uh, now a question actually to both of you, but it comes from a discussion we have had earlier, Knut. Um, you told me, um, China matters. China as a region matters. Like also when you want to affect scale, you want to affect change in this world, no matter where, let's say, you launch as a company, China as a region matters. And, and for that matter, I would also then, we can briefly talk about Southeast Asia, but maybe well, what's your, your thinking behind this? Why do you say this? Yeah, to just answer this in one line, I mean, um, it's quarter or a fifth of the total population on this planet and they are um, very impactful consumers. Um, but with a little story, the way I met Joan is when he facilitated at the mouth or the delta of the Yangtze River, um, and it is the confluence with the Huangpu River, the largest river of Shanghai and the largest river of China and one of the largest of the world, he facilitated an activity, a cleanup, which we now call plastic pirates. Um, and we were wading in really knee-high styrofoam. Um, and he has this great experiential learning approach that you do this together as a family, as a team, Boy Scout teams, and uh, you discuss actually what you pick up and you have a sharing and you make up a story. You see there's, I don't know, Korean letters um, on, on the styrofoam, there's Japanese letters on the packaging. Um, you find all different kinds of waste and then you start to talk, so um, where did this waste come from? And, um, and John then put science into those activities and uh, we learned from this activity that um, almost half of all plastic waste in the oceans is coming from the Yangtze River, one river alone. So I actually shared the slide before and I would like to share it afterwards, that's, that's science. And I think the Yangtze River, to a certain extent, exemplifies the impact on China uh, on our world in, in every regard. It's not only solid waste, it's uh, emissions. Um, so we need to integrate Chinese consumers, bottom-up citizens, if we cannot integrate the Chinese government. I mean, same story for ASEAN, isn't it, Southeast Asia? Because I recently heard now it's around six, 700 million yes, people so as well. I think size-wise, um, Southeast Asia is definitely not as huge as China, um, and it doesn't 
function as one country, right? It's so disparate, it's diverse. But what Southeast Asia really has is the youth and the people. So it's a huge growing region. A lot of it is super young, it's developing, rising, uh, rising uh, middle income groups. So over the next 10 years, you know, the purchasing power of, that, of the region is going to really double and make an impact. Uh, across the world. But I'd like to bring in China again into this conversation because what Southeast Asia feels a lot of times is the spillover effects of China. Because when, for even on something as simple as uh, environment, climate change uh, issues, when China now starts looking seriously into what their country wants to do or not with waste and recycling activities in relation to part outside uh, other parts of the world, like they've stopped um, receiving imports for waste, you know, we can't export waste into China anymore. Other parts of Southeast Asia are now suddenly over overwhelmed with all the waste that wants to go into them. And what this means is then that they, they are now having to look at the regulations again and start putting up uh, barriers for other countries around to stop uh, in, exporting their waste over, and, and Singapore as a small nation, we export a lot of our waste to our neighbors. What happens now is that waste companies in the, in, in the country find it really unprofitable to, to manage waste because it's so expensive, you'd ha literally have to, have to pay people to take in the waste, right? So when, uh, I mean, when China sneezes, the world catches a cold kind of thing, it, it's, it does really have um, a huge influence uh, across the region, and then because this is a big part of the world, and the spillover effects just like ripples on. Yeah, is what I like to add. What's here? We briefly touched on it with um, with um, our two speakers beforehand. Uh, let's say the mentality in Japan. What would you say? What's the general openness to like also using? new technologies like you are developing yourselves, but like just new solutions, the openness, let's say, of cities, Chinese in China, versus also maybe like across the region, like to experiment, um, to, um, to, you know, have an agile mindset and like test and try, something that sometimes we all feel here living in Europe, we are just too slow at, we are not like really like, you know, open enough to, to fail, to failure as such. What's the mentality in the two regions? Yeah, I, I guess you're asking a question uh, almost like why did we decide to set up operations in Europe? Um, I, I believe there's um, a tremendously fast acceptance of new uh, technologies and, and apps and everything in China, but only when they're approved by the government. And since 2017, um, Xi Jinping did a great job to really destroy the civil society. Um, I'm saying this openly here because it is a huge issue and a lot of people are um, really having a problem with that. Um, but the civil society is a pillar of, of, of any society. And if you want to bring certain solutions, uh, you know, you want to make them become viral or have an impact, you need the support of uh, non-corporate environments and non-government environments. So we are currently, we're talking with the Naturfreund and Nature Friends in Germany. It's a huge organization with 70,000 members. If we would be doing this in China, no way to do this without the government. We need an approval first. So yes, on one way, or on the one hand, maybe in Europe we're slow, but in some, some uh, parts of society, actually things can still move faster, I believe. I think from my point of view, there's this um, scrappiness and like in a good way that comes with the region, be it Southeast Asia and even China, where um, things a lot of times just get rolled out without having to be perfect or perfected. Uh, and, and people in general are very receptive towards just using something that's almost just half-baked, right? Because they need something to kind of uh, function and, and move along first. Whereas I think over here in in Europe, um, there is there is let's just say a legacy of things that have worked well, right? I think it was mentioned in a previous uh, session as well, and people are used to it. And when 
And when there's something new, there's always uh, there's more skepticism, like, will it work as well as the last? And if something doesn't work as well, you're like, uh, it's not as good. And therefore, the let's just say the appetite or the, or the environment for, for new things to just scrappily be adopted and start, started is a little bit more difficult, I find. Whereas, you know, back in, in Southeast Asia or in Asia in general, um, I, I would say we're just more used to things not working. <laughs> and then, you know, we just find out what works within that thing that doesn't work perfectly. And then we use those features, right? Like, for example, WeChat. Honestly, I think there can be so many ways that in, the user interface can be, a user experience can be better, right? But it just worked with a pretty, to be honest, messy interface and just had all the functions that people need. And they, they don't mind just having to tap a few more times to get to what they want, but they know it's there. So yeah, that's how they grow. And then you just keep growing on it. That sounds like a perfect me metaphor. <laughs> so I just want to finish finish this up by asking you guys. You know, you you're obviously very socially, environmentally driven in the best sense of let's say like social entrepreneurship, having a social problem or a cultural, environmental problem, and you try to address it through the means of like entrepreneurship. And um, how can people get in touch with you? How um, can they help you also, either as partners or um, through any other kind of support that you might be looking for right now? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. You can always find me there. Um, thing r right now, I mean, every startup wants needs. But <laughs> I think what really uh, is important right now is for the platform to prove its worth. And I would really love to speak to people who have um, projects that uh, that you think you know could involve uh, circularity in your process. So it could be something as simple as you know this bottle here. Um, say you're in farm and you're trying to build uh, your garden plots out of you know used bo glass bottles instead of having to buy and set up uh, a completely brand new gla uh, garden fencing system. Or you could be an artist, you know, you're trying to create installations and you don't want to have to purchase new materials to create them. You can make them out of old paper, old plastics. Um, yeah, schools, you know, you, you have projects that involve children um, to learn about the environment. What better way is it than, you know, doing beach cleanups, going through this packaging, giving them to another, another organization um, to make into something else and being able to see what that could become. And that's, I think, the best way to really help uh, people see and, and be inspired that, hey, what we produce and throw away actually has a lot more value than, than how we associate to, to them. Yeah. And Knut. Yeah, I mean, we, we are now on a very clear trajectory. We, we, we have come here also to Berlin um, to present what we have um, developed over the last six months, really in terms of software development. And we start uh, the beta phase with a couple of selected beta users uh, on October 1st. And uh, we, we were lucky to get uh, funding from the European Union, small funding, to um, hold a, a summit, a youth environmental education summit um, in the Austrian Hungarian National Park in spring, where we will present the production version. So we will continuously grow the number of organizations that have environmental education content and want to add this to the ARC because they believe that only together we can solve this crisis. Um, and to get in touch with us, I mean all interested organizations and, and um, environmental education professionals are invited to, of course, reach out to us. And are you planning any time soon to fundraise as well? Well, we are um, always on the fundraise, of course, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wilang from Gallery and Knut from Green Steps Arc. Um, to everyone else out there, definitely check, check them both out. Check out what they are working on. And um, thank you guys so much for this really exciting, also very personal conversation we're able to have here. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks. Thank you.